Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could I ask you to please take your seats? Well, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming out on, uh, on such a hot and humid day. And I uh, want to welcome everyone uh, this afternoon uh, to the presentation by the International Energy Agency of their medium-term uh, oil and gas markets review. Uh, for those I haven't met, I'm Guy Caruso of the Energy and National Security Program here. And on uh, behalf of Frank Verastro, the head of the program, I want to welcome you all and thank you all for being here uh, to hear from uh, the IEA and uh, its, um, you know, some of its most uh, experienced uh, experts. Uh, today we're going to hear about the outlook for oil and gas markets that go out goes out to uh, 2015. And this is an initiative that uh, was started in the IEA about five years ago and it fills that gap between the monthly oil market report which typically goes out 12 to uh, 24 months and the long-term outlook, which typically goes out about 20 years. So it, it's, it's an outlook that uh, looks at the, both the oil and gas markets in one combined publication for the first time. Uh, and uh, it, it is one of those that when you think about what are the things that can affect the uh, medium term, the investments that have been made both on the demand and the supply side pretty much in, in place. So those decisions have been taking and taken uh, as well as uh, many of the policy issues. So this focuses in on what does, what do these investment decisions, these policy decisions that are in place, what impact will they have over the next three to five years? So. Uh, Clearly, even even with that, there are wild cards, and the most obvious one is the uh, oil spill and its impact on both oil and gas markets uh, in this time frame. So we're lucky enough to uh, be able to hear from uh, three of the IEA's leadership uh, today, and it's starting with Ambassador uh, Richard Jones. Dick is a senior. Uh, diplomat who left the Foreign Service to join the IEA about 18 uh, months ago as the Deputy Executive Director and Dick has had a wealth of experience in including four ambassadorships and other senior positions in, uh, in energy producing uh, countries for the most part and the latest uh, ambassadorship before leaving the Foreign Service was uh, in Israel extremely important position, but he's also served in uh, producing countries like Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. So it brings uh, enormous uh, knowledge of the region, the oil and gas producing region, as well as a, an understanding of uh, the politics and the, and, the, and the international issues. He'll be followed uh, uh, on the oil market uh, outlook uh, by David Fife. David is the uh, division head for oil markets and industry in the IEA, has been in that position for several years, but had had more than 20 years of experience analyzing oil markets uh, in the IEA and for uh, consulting firms in the UK and David's uh, native country is Scotland. He'll be then followed by Ian Cronshaw, who is the head of the uh, division that deals with natural gas and other uh, fuels such as the uh, uh, nuclear and renewables as well as electricity market. So Ian brings uh, more than 30 years of experience in uh, many senior positions within the Australian government and the ministries that uh, have dealt with energy. And uh, so we're really very fortunate today to have three very knowledgeable and uh, expert presenters. And uh, we're going to try to leave uh, fair amount of time for Q&A because I know this is a very uh, experienced and knowledgeable audience. I want to hear from from you what what your uh, 
issues are and what you'd like to hear from uh, the IEA leadership. So uh, without any uh, further ado, I want to uh, ask uh, Ambassador Jones to uh, kick it off with, uh, with an overview and then uh, followed by David and then Ian. Well, uh, thank you very much, Guy, for that uh, um, opening uh, introduction. I don't think I appreciate all that high praise, but I'll take it anyway. Um, anyway, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I want to thank you again, uh, Guy, and all your friends, at C all our friends at CSIS, for hosting uh, today's launch of the medium-term oil and gas markets 2010. As uh, always, the warm welcome and efficient organization afforded by CSIS has been outstanding. The MTOGM, as we call it, is a brand new report, as Guy mentioned, combining our annual review of natural gas uh, market trends with the regular medium-term projections we generate for the oil market. These markets are different in many ways, but there are, all, there are also areas of convergence, and we are seeing increasing interaction between oil, gas, and power markets. We therefore decided to present our medium-term analyses together and to allow our readers to draw their own conclusions. The two lead authors who have been introduced will shortly provide you with more details. Uh, but first, let me point out some of the key similarities and differences between the two markets, review some of the central findings from the publication. First, in terms of comparisons between the two fuels, we see many similarities upstream. Multi-billion dollar investments in both oil and gas frequently are made by the same countries, companies, and in many cases in the same reservoir. Downstream, the two fuels have in the past competed head-to-head -head in power and industrial markets. These interactions continue today, even though the oil use has become much more concentrated in the transport and petrochemical sectors than before. In terms of market structure and pricing, oil is a genuinely global commodity, while gas markets, although globalizing, remain bound by some key regional constraints, including difficulties in transportation and distribution. Beyond this, however, the two markets face some similar challenges. A central similarity is uncertainty. Uncertainties in the global economic environment, over the pace at which future supplies can be developed, uncertainty surrounding the strategies for improving end-use efficiency, and the perennial uncertainty surrounding market data for both markets. Finally, we're also seeing a trend in which many international oil companies confronting barriers to access for new oil reserves and amid economic and technological improvements in the ability to tap gas are enriching their business portfolios by adding gas to oil. We only need to consider the experience of 2008 and 2009 when U.S. production rose by a combined 48 billion cubic meters, largely from non-conventional sources, to appreciate the game-changing power that innovative uh, technology combined with sustained investment has. These are some of the reasons behind our decision to present the two market outlooks together this year. We hope their combination into one document will be of use to all of you and other market uh, watchers. Turning now to the uh, medium term outlook, both oil and gas are enjoying a degree of breathing space in 2010. From the rapid tightening in markets we envisaged just one year ago, the recession in 2008-2009 curbed economic activity and with it demand for both fuels. Oil and gas markets are now starting to show signs of recovery, but the impact of the recession differs across regions and the outlook remains very uncertain. In both oil and gas, we see notable differences between non-OECD and OECD markets with strong growth in China, India, and the Middle East compared to weaker or flat demand elsewhere, especially in the fragile European economy. Of course, these contrasting trends make it harder to foresee market developments in the medium term with confidence. Let me comment uh, for a moment on investment. Our report calls for further sustained efforts in this regard. And the call for more investments may seem a at least a bit strange at a time of plentiful OPEC spare capacity and uh, reports of a gas glut thanks to ample LNG and non-conventional gas sources. While the supply side outlook does look easier 
than it did a year ago. Project lead times remain stretched. Investment has, uh, has to match not only increasing demand, but also production declines at mature fields. In fact, the ratio is about three to one uh, of uh, decline versus new. For oil, such production declines may amount to more than three million barrels per day. What's more, geopolitical risks and the ever-present possibility of game-changing events, such as the Deepwater Horizon disaster, are uncertainties that could transform the upstream outlook in relatively short order. Thus, our message on investment remains strong. The world needs timely and adequate investment in spite of potentially easier markets short and medium term. As the CEO of an oil major put it in a recent discussion that I witnessed, the best time to invest is when the market is low. Before I turn to the demand outlook, let me pause for a moment to comment on the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. This is a catastrophe that well could have been avoided. We appreciate that the U.S. government is now exerting great efforts to mitigate the impact of the oil spill and that ahead of the results of its major inquiry into the incident, deep water activity has naturally been affected. The disaster's short-term market impact has so far been minimal. Producing fields have not been affected, of course. For the longer term, much will depend on the pre uh, precise cause identified and the measures implemented to prevent any repeat of this uh, catastrophe. As mentioned in our uh, uh, MG, MTOGM report, um, as an example, uh, were, drilling, uh, were drilling delays of one or two years to result from the, the disaster, the impact on new deep water projects could curb 2015 U.S. Gulf production by 100 to 300,000 barrels per day. Although it's unlikely, similar delays worldwide could ramp that number up to 800 to 900,000 barrels per day. And here I should know that, note that, that offshore production today accounts for a third of global oil supply, will be even more important for ensuring our longer term supplies. Half of new additions to supply towards 2015 will be offshore. Moreover, world oil demand is expected to continue to grow despite energetic efforts to promote clean energy and energy efficiency in several countries. Policy measures arising from this calamity therefore need to be balanced. Accelerating the use of cleaner sources of energy and greater end use efficiency, while at the same time acknowledging the need to sustain investment in new sources of oil and gas, including those in deep water. Now, back to the publication. Uh, economic recovery should bring renewed growth in demand for oil and gas. This demand will be concentrated in non-OECD countries. But of, of course, projections of demand are never 100 percent certain. This publication examines the impact of several different combinations of GDP growth and oil intensity, thereby elucidating a variety of potential market outcomes. For the longer term, we clearly need to devote more attention to improved end-use efficiency and to diversification of fuel supplies, including from zero-carbon sources, if we are to maintain more comfortable oil and gas markets. This is why we are highlighting a third a scenario for the longer term in this report, in which we show that accelerated improvements in energy efficiency could enable strong economic growth without excessive tightening of the supply-demand balance. Such an approach could maintain spare capacity for oil at close to the current five to six million uh, barrel per day level, while slowing the expected steady increase in demand for OPEC crude. The potential benefits of keeping energy efficiency front and center in the policy framework are clear. As President Obama reiterated recently, we must move toward new, towards new, cleaner sources of energy and redouble our efforts on energy efficiency. Finally, I'd like to mention the importance of improvements in both oil and gas market data. This is vital if we, are to, if we are to genuinely understand what the future may hold. Oil data have continued to improve in terms of transparency, global coverage, and timeliness. Nonetheless, much remains to be done to improve their coverage of non-OECD markets. Gas data is unfortunately much weaker in almost all respects both in and outside the OECD, but especially outside of the OECD. 
as a partner organization in the joint oil data initiative or jody we fully support the decisions to extend jody to gas market data we believe this will lead to better information on markets and more timely investment decisions it should also help to reduce episodes of excessive price volatility or at least mitigate them so let me close by saying again that I hope you like this new joint publication. As data improves for gas, it is our hope to include more integrated modeling and analysis in future editions. So I'm now pleased to ask David Fife, editor of the oil section of the report, and then Ian Cronshaw to take you through the main highlights of medium term oil and gas markets 2000. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jones, and thank you, Guy. Uh, and a big, uh, big thank you to CSIS for customary, well-organized, uh, well-attended events. It's very pleasing to see uh, such a distinguished audience uh, to discuss our, our medium-term outlook for the market. Um, we've already heard about some of the rationale of pulling these two sets of projections together, and we've already heard a little bit about um, some of the, uh, the sort of methodology or the approach that we take. This is not an aspirational sort of policy document. This attempts to be uh, an analytical view of what is likely to occur, in our view, by 2015, given the investments that are already taking place, giving, given the policies in terms of uh, fuel efficiency, uh, in terms of uh, price subsidies, et cetera, that are currently in place or can be envisaged uh, being implemented over the next three to five years. So it, it's very much an attempt to, to, to see where we think it most likely, uh, in my case, the oil sector will be by, by 2015. When we look at the, the exercise this year and the projections this year, uh, there's a, s a certain sense of déjà vu, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. There are some similarities with the projections that we uh, generated a, a year ago, but some important differences. We foc focus, of course, as, as usual, on market fundamentals, while at the same time acknowledging that um, economic and or macroeconomic and financial factors have played a role. And it ebb and flow role uh, in terms of uh, influencing markets over the past couple of years. What about starting points? Well, we, we have a, an underlying uh, price deck that is rather higher than it was 12 months ago when we did the 2009 uh, set of projections. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in, in a moment. Uh, we do at least have uh, the beginnings of economic recovery underway which is not really something that 12, 18 months ago we could have been particularly certain about. And although there is some uh, continuing doubt about the uh, sustainability and the pace of that economic recovery, nonetheless, it is a slightly more optimistic view uh, than we confronted uh, in, in uh, spring 2009. That said, there's still a sufficient number of uh, uncertainties on the macroeconomic side that encourage us to retain a sort of uh, demand-side scenario approach. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, as we've already heard, the non-OECD really is the driver on the demand side. We think basically that OECD oil demand uh, has peaked and is unlikely to rise again uh, over this outlook period. So all of the action is really happening in markets, A, where visibility of fundamentals is more patchy than it is for the OECD, uh, and but B, also importantly, where there are some market distortions, including things like price subsidies, which help sustain uh, the level of demand growth over this outlook period, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, in general terms, we're a little bit more optimistic this year on the supply side than we were 12 months ago. We're not complacent about supply. We still think global oil supply uh, or the ability of the industry to expand supply is constrained and will remain so. But nonetheless, the baseline has shifted rather higher as prices have proved to be rather stronger uh, and spending levels have been more robust than we envisaged even 12 to 15 months ago. Uh, we've seen 
an impact in higher spending, both in terms of mature field decline and also new project delivery, uh, which has come in rather ahead of our expectations uh, from 2009. As I say, partly because of higher spend and some progress in bringing down costs from the sort of 2007, 2008 peaks uh, uh, that, that we saw a couple of year, years ago. The big question is how, how sustainable is that easing on the supply side? Uh, there are several things going on, not least uh, on the Gulf Coast, which could indeed uh, lead to stretching project lead times and higher project costs in the months and years ahead, which is obviously something we need to, to uh, take account of. Um, when we look downstream, we are still very, very pessimistic about the prospects for uh, the OECD refining sector. Um, I, we think there's quite a lot of rationalization still to come uh, in, that, in that segment of the industry um, under pressure from some of the, the demand growth areas where capacity is being expanded. Overall, the picture is of market balances that are a little bit more comfortable than we were envisaging 12 months ago. Uh, and even six months ago when we did our, uh, our interim update of these projections. Um, but really sustaining that slightly more comfortable position uh, for the market uh, beyond 2015 is going to depend, as, as we've already heard, on the pace at which investment can be uh, uh, funneled into the industry and also the extent to which the impetus uh, which has been given to efficiency gains by high prices uh, continues over the medium and longer term. Some starting points for our projections, uh, we deploy basically the future strip as our pricing assumption uh, for, our, for our projections looking forward. And it's interesting to note that compared to a year ago, prices are between 50 and $20 higher through that five-year future strip than they were uh, last year. So that clearly is something that has quite an impact certainly on the supply side and to some extent on the, on the, on the demand side. As I said, we, we continue to run with a couple of scenarios for the macro economy. Uh, we take our cue from the sort of consensus view uh, uh, amongst some of the major uh, financial institutions, including the IMF. So our base case is, is pegged on a level of growth of around about 4.5% on a trend basis going forward, but we recognize the degree of macroeconomic uncertainty that is out there by deploying a, a lower GDP case of around 3% per annum on an underlying basis uh, looking forward. We're not specifically factoring in a Eurozone crisis or a double dip or whatever. We're just simply trying to acknowledge that economic recovery may be retarded by some of the imbalances that exist um, in, in national budgets and in international uh, capital flows. We're tying that in this year, however, with a degree of sensitivity on the pace of efficiency gains going forward. Uh, the higher GDP case, uh, we're deploying efficiency gains of about 3% per annum in oil use intensity. Uh, and that is basically what we've seen over the past five or six years. Uh, intrinsically under a, a rather lower GDP case, and implicitly slightly lower levels of prices, you would expect uh, gains in end user efficiency to be slightly lower. And all we're plugging in there is the sort of 15-year uh, average of around about 2% annual gains uh, in end use efficiency. So those are some of the starting points for the projections. And when we, when we look at it on the demand side, um, here are some of the results. And really the, the, the difference, just to, to, to put it very, very quickly, uh, by 2015, the difference between those two cases is around 2.1 million barrels per day. We're looking at a world of either 92 million barrels per day of 2015 demand or something closer to 90 million barrels per day. And it's the difference between growth of 1.1, 1.2 million barrels per day every year uh, and under the base or higher GDP case and a world of seven to 800,000 barrels uh, per day of annual growth going forward. And really, that may not seem all that much of a difference, but in, a, in, a, in a, an oil market that works at the margin, that's actually quite an important difference uh, going forward. Uh, but you can see some of the, the different sort of combinations of GDP growth and potential efficiency gains and how those shift uh, 
2015 demand uh, going forward on the right-hand side. So clearly there's a very high degree of sensitivity uh, in any sort of forecasting exercise of this, this type. And, and we believe in just setting out some of the ranges of oil demand that we could expect under these different uh, combinations going forward. But you know, our, our bottom line is of, of demand growth of something around a million barrels per day on an annual, on the al annualized basis going forward. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because this is really uh, sort of obvious, but the bulk of that demand growth is coming from outside the OECD. We think OECD oil demand has, has, has peaked, uh, has leveled off. We think there are structural changes that continue to take place in the OECD. They're happening in the power generation uh, and the industrial sector with oil being backed out by gas and other fuels. And we're seeing well, we certainly have seen over the past two to three years, I think, a, a sea change in attitudes on this side of the Atlantic in terms of vehicle fuel efficiency and so on that we think will probably remain embedded uh, over this outlook period and particularly with the sort of price assumptions that we're deploying of sort of $75, $85 per barrel uh, going forward based on the future strip. Um, so all of the action in terms of demand growth is coming out of Asia, the Middle East, to some extent Latin America, all uh, not coincidentally markets where the end use price of energy is very highly subsidized uh, and therefore the income effect and the depressant effect on prices in terms of domestic, what people pay domestically for fuel uh, gives us fairly strong levels of growth uh, in these markets going forward. And transport and petrochemicals for us remain the key sectors as oil use becomes increasingly concentrated uh, in premium end use uh, sectors. We can't talk about oil demand without referring to the puzzle that is uh, China. And of course, data issues here become uh, fairly important because everyone trying to monitor oil demand developments in China is, is working with a, a, a very incomplete set of cards. Uh, we have very poor visibility on actual demand within the Chinese market. Um, there are some question marks even about economic uh, data coming out of China. And of course, it makes forecasting very, very difficult. But nonetheless, we still see this economy uh, generating around half of expected global demand growth going forward, uh, which is obviously very, very significant. And this is pinned on an assumption of something like 9 to 10% annual, annual GD GDP growth going forward, uh, generating about half a million barrels per day each year of incre incremental oil demand, which is obviously uh, very, very important looking forward. Um, a, li a quick word on, on, oil on price subsidies, and it's, it's something that the IEA has been mandated by uh, the G20 to look into, along with some partner organizations going forward. Um, and it's, it's a piece of work which uh, Fatih Birol's team that works on the World Energy Outlook will be reporting upon in, in November. Um, estimates of around $550 billion spent on energy subsidies uh, in 2008, albeit that's probably a high point in terms of, of uh, energy prices, uh, but obviously it introduces a number of distortions uh, into the market. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that, for example, in the Middle East, uh, in, in our outlook period through 2015, probably around 70% of what OPEC uh, Middle Eastern member countries are doing in terms of expanding crude capacity is going to be gobbled up by uh, local demand growth in large part because of the presence not, not only of rapidly growing economies but the, uh, the existence of high levels of end user price subsidy. Um, and it's obviously something that is a huge financial burden on some of these economies. Now, places like India are beginning to grapple with this sort of issue, but when we make these projections, we're not forecasting that all of these subsidies are gonna be taken away overnight. Um, we have done some work in the broader IEA, which suggests that 2020 oil demand were subsidies to be uh, phased out over the next 10 years. 2020 oil demand could be as much as five or six million barrels per day lower than in a case where they were kept in place. Now by 2015, what could the impact be? It's difficult to say. We haven't really done that, that exercise. 
it makes a little bit less sense for the, for the shorter term. But clearly, one to two million barrels per day off 2015 oil demand in the event of lower price subsidies would have a, ver a fairly uh, large impact uh, on the market. Turning to the supply side, as I said, we are a little bit more optimistic than we were a year ago. We see growth of about 5.5 million barrels per day in total global supply capacity going forward. Uh, the baseline is, is looking rather higher. Um, Non-OPEC surprised on the upside in 2009. Russia, Colombia, uh, the North Sea, and Mexico, uh, some of those producers facing inexorable decline in production, but higher levels of spending and higher prices uh, meant that decline was slightly less steep than we and some others were expecting. As I say, it's, 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 it's no reason for complacency, and as Ambassador Jones mentioned, we still lose something between three and three and a half million barrels per day of global capacity each year because of decline. So it's a huge number. It's just it's not uh, some of the increased spending and higher levels of prices has helped offset some of that uh, decline uh, going forward. Um, we think probably the supply side can manage about a million barrels per day net, averaged over five years uh, going forward. Um, so clearly you can see the sort of tipping point in our global balances uh, if demand growth is more than a million barrels per day or if it's less than a million barrels, barrels per day. Uh, sources of growth are quite important. It's important to point, to point out that crude oil is not the key source of growth or conventional crude is not the key source of growth uh, going forward. Actually, gas liquids generate about 55% of the expected growth in global oil supply through 2015. Much of that uh, derived from some of the LNG projects that are being developed in the, the Middle Eastern Gulf. Um, also, as gas producers tap deeper, wetter formations and, and curb flaring. So NGLs uh, have a huge impact on the, the supply balance going forward. We've also got things like biofuels uh, and non-conventional oil from places such as Canada uh, going forward. So it's not really a story about conventional crude oil, which looks rather more static in overall terms. Um, it's much more about the other liquids and in becoming increasingly so uh, in this forecast. Non-opaque, as I said, looking rather stronger uh, than we expected uh, last time around. I've mentioned the key sources, Canadian oil sands, Brazil, deep water, pre-salt, biofuels making an important contribution, Colombia, heavy oil uh, from Colombia and the Caspian uh, are key sources of supply growth there. And some of the, uh, the usual suspects on the right-hand side of the graph in terms of maturing production uh, in OECD producing areas. Of course, any forecast is merely that. It's a forecast, and it can be thrown off course by any one of a number of, of key elements. We've already talked about uh, Deepwater Horizon and the Macondo well. Uh, we don't factor a sharp slowdown in deepwater production into our, our projections, but we acknowledge that something between 300 and uh, 900 kBD of impact by 2015 is possible, as Ambas Ambassador Jones already mentioned. I think it's just worth noting that the, the transferability of what happens in terms of new regula regulatory regime and new operating practices uh, in the U.S. Gulf, it may not automatically transfer to other uh, administrations because a lot of changes were made in terms of deep water operating regimes in Europe and elsewhere uh, after the Piper Alpha disaster in 1988. But we're going to be watching that and and factoring in some allowance for delays in deep water as, as some of the remedies suggested after Macondo become clearer. Uh, and also clearly uh, doubts about decline rates. Can spending be sustained at mature assets uh, to slow decline uh, at older depleted fields? That's a big question. Uh, and clearly on the right-hand side you of that graph, you can see how important that is, a 1% swing uh, in assumed decline rates going forward can shift the supply side by anything up to 2 million barrels per day. So we're not complacent about our own forecasting model uh, and we, we try and track field by field decline as we can on a monthly basis in our, our oil market report.
Looking to OPEC very quickly, I mean, we've got about 2 million barrels per day of crude capacity growth out of OPEC. Half of that is coming from Iraq. So our bottom line assumption is that Iraq can probably manage about 3.5 million barrels per day by 2015 compared to about 2.5 million barrels per day today. There's a lot of uncertainties surrounding that outlook, but it's a little more uh, optimistic than last year, purely on the, the progress that has been made in the joint venture projects there. We don't think 6 million is doable in that sort of time horizon, but we do think there is some upside uh, compared to existing capacity levels in Iraq. But the challenges are huge uh, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, a political structure being in place that would allow that expansion to take place, and in terms of midstream and downstream capacity to get the oil to market, whether that's in terms of domestic refining in Iraq or whether it's uh, getting it out to export um, for markets, to growth markets going, going forward. Um, Saudi Arabia, we keep a fairly flat profile of just below 12 million barrels per day. Uh, we think Saudi Arabia, or we assume Saudi Arabia, will continue to play the sort of swing supplier role going forward. And then we think they're going to do a bit of work on some of their mature fields over the outlook period, which will put a sort of cap on operational capacity levels going forward. Nigeria to us looks a little bit less optimistic than it did a year ago uh, because of uh, geopolitical developments there and also uh, the threat of the petroleum industry bill which is hanging over a number of investments and which we basically think will slow investment uh, offshore Nigeria. We've actually got a little bit of growth coming from Venezuela. Uh, it's, it's fairly marginal in overall terms but we do think some of the progress on joint venture projects in the Orinoco does hold some prospect for expansion overall for Venezuela, but really it's largely offsetting uh, decline elsewhere within that country uh, going forward. A couple of words on biofuels, which is obviously an important part of growth, about 800,000 barrels per day of the growth we expect between now and 2015 in terms of supply. Most of that's coming out of the US and Brazil, uh, as we look forward, we're not simply taking uh, demand side targets for biofuels in our supply equation. We're trying to look at what is actually being built today and what we think can be brought to fruition by 2015 going forward. It's an industry that has relatively short lead times and there can therefore can adapt to changing economics uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, but there's around about 13% of incremental uh, gasoline and gas oil demand that could be met uh, from biofuels going forward over this time horizon. Uh, but there's a big question about sustainability. There are lots of targets in place, but a lot of those targets, in order to be met, will probably require second generation biofuels. Uh, and quite frankly, at prices below $100 per barrel on a sustainable basis, a lot of the second generation biofuels technologies simply don't work. So we think second generation biofuels is probably more a 2020 issue rather than a 2015 issue in anything other than fairly marginal volumes looking ahead. We also take a look obviously at the downstream and the sort of crude feedstock slate that the global refining industry is going to be confronting over coming years and you can see we expect an initial, an, uh, an initial lighter, sweeter barrel partly because of some of those NGLs and condensates and lighter crude supplies that are coming to the market. And then we see a sort of turning point around 2012 when global feedstock supplies become heavier and, uh, and sourer again over the outlook period, and particularly Latin America, Canadian oil sands, um, and declining light sweet North Sea production play into that uh, deterioration in quality going forward. Um, I have to, I'm going to skip for the sake of time quite quickly over the refining sector, but basically despite weak margins, we see about 9 million barrels per day of new primary refining capacity being built over the outlook period. The bulk of that is occurring in those growth markets in China, Asia, the Middle East, uh, and you can see it's running well ahead of expected growth in oil demand, even under our more optimistic oil demand scenario. Uh, looking forward. And the bottom line is that means that OECD utilization rates uh, are going to fall or continue to fall over the outlook period in the absence of further industry rationalization. And we actually think uh, 
uh, that to get global refinery utilization back to around 85%, which may be a proxy for reasonable levels of profitability, uh, something like 7 million barrels per day of capacity overhang has to be addressed. Now, of course, the problem with the refining industry is it frequently grapples with uh, boom and bust and overcapacity, and it never actually ends up closing all of that capacity because of the difficulties and the costs uh, inherent in trying to shut capacity going forward. Another key uh, conclusion from our study is that uh, the, the global refining industry remains uh, suboptimally con sub configured to generate the growth in middle distillate demands, diesel and jet fuel, uh, that we think are going to drive oil demand growth uh, going forward. So summing up, um, economic uncertainty on the demand side, uh, on the supply side, a slightly more optimistic position uh, overall, although a lot of that growth is coming from um, uh, other oil suppliers rather than conventional crude oil. Uh, we see a refining sector that is prone to boom and bust, as has always been the case. And we generate, to pull it all together, a couple of global oil supply balances. The higher GDP, higher oil demand growth case has the market tightening again from around 2012 onwards. Uh, and that would tend to be associated with more jittery, nervous markets looking forward. The very fact of that tightening in the spare capacity cushion is likely to be a, a destabilizing influence overall on the market. Uh, rather more comfortable levels of spare capacity persisting through mid-decade in the lower GDP case, or if we saw continued impetus for improved efficiency gains, although obviously achieving that in the three to five year time horizon, accelerating investment in efficiency is rather more difficult and that may rather be something uh, for the medium and longer term overall. We think one million barrels per day is the sort of key tipping point for the market uh, and uh, I leave those two scenarios with you. Thank you for your attention and sorry to Ian for overrunning and eating into his time. Thank you. Prevail on someone to find that presentation. I'll just while Lisa's while Lisa's fixing that, let me just add my my thanks to uh, to Guy and the team for organising a, a brilliant event here again and uh, particularly um, for organising the warm weather just to make an Australian feel a bit homesick, um, <laughs> although the humidity's not, not all that Australian. Um, <coughs> I guess you also discovered after David's dulcet Scottish tones, you've, you've got stuck with an Australian accent, which might not be the hardest English language to uh, English dialect to understand, but comes pretty close to it. And it gets worse because we, um, when I speak gas, of course, the gas world doesn't have a un united set of language. Um, set of units, so I'm going to speak a sort of Esperanto of gas, which means nobody will understand me at all. Um, <coughs> we use BCM for volumes and, and dollars per million BTU for, uh, for prices, so hopefully you'll be at least be able to understand the prices. Um, just a, the quick fundamentals of what we try to describe, 2010, 2009-10 uh, fundamentals, a really dramatic fall in demand, particularly in OECD countries, non-OECD, as David said, a different story. Um, but coupled with that, a double supply shock um, in a positive sense, unconventional gas, particularly in the United States, a truly astonishing story, plus the, the great surge in LNG supplies, still mostly to come, I might add, still mostly to come. And, and this is amazing delinkaging between spot prices and, and the oil index prices, which have dominated at least the European sector of, of the industry. And this has got some, some short-term consequences. Um, not the least being a lot of utilities have found themselves, particularly in Europe, stuck with these large-scale take-or-pay obligations which have really come unstuck in a, in a pretty interesting way. Everybody asks the question, how much can these oil-based prices last in this environment? And of course, fr from a longer-term perspective, when do people start to invest again, especially if you're Gazprom, just to pick one company, um, when and where, um, and how long will this gas supply glut last? Because it is a, ga a gas supply glut. 
um, by anyone's standards, how will, and how will it unwind in a geographical and market sense. Firstly, to, to our OECD gas data, and of course the, the caveat about the data applies, um, our non-OECD data is poor, can talk a bit more about that, even our OECD data could certainly be improved. We've been working on this for five years or so with our members, finally got it to the point where I'm comfortable putting up a, a monthly graph like this, showing obviously in 2008, early part of 2008, strong demand for gas through the OECD. Gas was very competitively priced, was available everywhere, and of course, come, come the autumn of 2008, all came to a shuddering quick halt and, and these sharp falls um, culminating, I guess, in the spring of, of last year, and then a slow recovery. And what looks like at the end of that graph, something a bit more interesting, but of course we had a very cold winter. I don't think I need to tell people in DC that, that last winter was cold, but certainly everywhere in Europe it was cold as well. We had heating degree days of more than 20% above average in Germany, France and, and the United Kingdom. That means you have to go back to 1987 to have a, a cold winter like this. So unfortunately when you adjust some of those numbers, what, what you end up with is something like for OECD, we went down 3.3%. But the United States was, was only down 1.7, which tells you the rest of OECD countries were much more heavily affected. Um, UK, minus 8, Spain, minus 11, even Germany, minus 5.5. So this is a pretty sad story and, and a recovery just in a very early nascent stage. Um, this is a complicated slide, but <coughs> let me just focus on that little bit right up the end here. And you know, it may not look like much, but when you, you take it back, um, when we did first did these calculations, it looked like Europe was going to go back to somewhere like 2001 gas demand. As the year panned out, it, it looks more like 2002 or 3. Now that is a long way back for a mature market that's only growing about 1% per annum. It's, it's a market that's going to take a long time to come back, um, even on some very optimistic forecasts. Just sort of focusing in again on this trend data, and again, you can see there the worst of the recession was, was late, I guess, 2008 into... Uh, into the spring of 2009. Um, when we did our WEO forecast last year, we did them right down the bottom there with those jagged lines and, and there were some, you know, people were making some pretty dire predictions. It does look to have come back a bit, but still, um, still you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be betting the shirt, you wouldn't be betting the, uh, the farm on that one. For the first time this year, we actually made a rather bold attempt to, to duplicate David's effort in terms of a medium term forecast. Only OECD and only out to 2013, um, but again, this is a, a fairly sad story when you, when you look at it. Obviously, 2009, a big, big fall, 50 BCM, more than the gas use in, of France, just to, just to pick a country. A bit of a recovery in 2010, but again, cold weather. When you factor in normal weather, we actually see gas demand flat next year and then slowly recovering. And in Europe, you don't get back to 2007, 8 levels till after that forecast period, 2014, 2015. Now obviously that's, that's pretty controversial, um, a, lot of, a lot of companies um, in the European theatre don't, don't believe it, it will be that pessimistic, um, we've had already had some pretty, pretty robust feedback on that graph, um, not the least being from our Russian colleagues, I was in Moscow last week where it's just, just as hot, they turn on the hot weather as well. Um, of course one thing you have to remember when we talk about Europe is that this is demand, European production is also falling and falling sharply. United Kingdom last year down 15%, 1.5, I kid you not. Um, okay, prices were low, but that was a very big fall. And of course that means in terms of imports, um, you have to look at that picture as well. Just to reinforce this point, it's not a global market, as, as sort of fairly obviously, but it is globalising and it's acting, interacting in all kinds of interesting ways through that little icon of the LNG market. I'll come to that in a minute, the way LNG is particularly operating across the Atlantic, very interesting. We also have this collection of countries over here on the right, um, which in fact, as a group, make up more than half of global gas markets. That happened back in 2007. And of course, they're the countries that are growing rapidly. I'll get to the end of the presentation and talk a little bit more about those. But certainly, um, the way this market works is, um, it continu continues to be a humbling experience for the forecaster, I think it's probably the politest way to say it. US, a really astonishing story. I mean, I look back at our WEO forecast in 2005 when I, I joined the IEA and we were forecasting at that point, um, we were looking at 2004 data, which was I think a little over 500, and we were forecasting a nice genteel decline over five or six years down to about 450 BCM or thereabouts. And I don't, don't think that was a particularly um, off the scale forecast, pretty much a consensus forecast. And indeed, um, a lot of people bet real money in terms of meeting 
that falling output because of course demand was going to grow. Um, some people bet real money in places like Qatar and, and elsewhere on filling that demand. But of course, as you know, um, 2009, the actual was 600 BCM, 150 BCM out in a six year period. Now that's forecasting error writ large, I think. But let's be honest, that is a fantastic performance. Even as prices have continued to fall, we've seen rises there. 2009, um, continued growth of 3.5%, even into the first quarter of 2010, continued growth. And at some point, that growth will have to stop because um, demand is recovering that quickly. S the storage just can't, can't cope. But it is still an astonishing story. And I mean, even as, f even as a year ago, people were still saying, well, you know, some of these guys have got to stop producing at six or five or four. And the answer seems to be more like three. So this is, this is, and this does have global consequences because, um, because of the next slide, which is, which is LNG. And this is an industry that took the best part of 40 years to get to the 240 BCM of output that we saw in 2008. Um, as you can see here in the next three to four years, we anticipate up a 50% increase, 120 BCM, um, non-trivial. A lot of this output, I mean, the capacity has formally ended service, but we've got a whole collection of mainly technical issues um, certainly into some of the mega trains. Um, s this is still to come on the markets later, later this year, um, next year a lot more to come. Um, there's also some feed gas, issues, feed gas issues, I might add, places like Oman and Egypt and Algeria, which I can come to. The good news is after a bit of a drought the last five years, we have seen some new investments um, come on. Last year we saw both Gorgon and the Papua New Guinea LNG project get the go-ahead, both big expensive projects. And we may well, over the course of this year, see a coal bed methane project go ahead, which would be a very interesting project indeed. So the people who are underwriting those projects certainly believe that the gas industry has a future post-2015. Post and of course, those projects are going ahead with, with China as the foundation customer. Gorgon, interesting thing about Gorgon is it is the first project that has gone ahead with China as the foundation customer. Um, my Japanese colleagues always, always get a bit irritated when I say that because they're very quick to point out that Japanese interests have signed up for Gorgon as well but I think it's fair to say that China was the, the key factor in accelerating what's been a difficult project to bring to FID. Uh, uh, another important point here is of course a lot of, um, a lot of company interests behind this. The, uh, this LNG is much more flexible in its marketing. The old, the old model of say with Japan where you have north northwest shelf of Australia, you have the tankers going seven days there, seven days back very fixed model, a lot more, this is a lot more liquid and it will move around and it does move around, which is both good economic news, it's also good security news when you have a problem you know, like we had in 2009 with Ukraine, some of that spot LNG from Oman, for example, found its way to Turkey, which was, which was pretty handy and also to Greece. A and as David noted, of course, this has had very important um, repercussions in the liquids markets as well. Okay, uh, turning to prices, and if you needed any convincing that this isn't quite a globalised market, this chart certainly provides it, because um, apart from being information rich and, and confusing, uh, um, <laughs> extremely confusing, I actually I used to have the oil price in there just to add complete confusion to it all. But um, let's just start with the lines one by one. Um, if you look at these, I guess it's a sort of reddish line on top, that's the, um, the Japanese LNG price, and that follows oil pretty closely with about a three month lag. So you don't, you don't get rich punting on the Japanese LNG price, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the blue line below it is the German border price. Now this is a, a market that lacks transparency, sadly, so we have to kind of work out the, uh, the, the, uh, the oil index price in Europe. And that we, get to we do that by looking at the German numbers, but every now and again a few interesting things happen. And you can see there it didn't follow the, uh, the Japanese price um, back in 2008. And at the moment when it ought to be going up, it isn't, it's staying flat. So this, the good news here is that we are starting to see some spot gas entering that German market and backing out expensive oil gas or oil indexed gas. Bottom two lines, a bit more familiar, Henry Hub, the, the cheapest, and it, it looks as though Henry Hub is, is going to become the floor for, certainly for OECD, international e OECD prices. And interesting enough, the line above it, the NBP, the British price, the last 12 months has seen a very close correlation. Um, essentially on the back of a virtual LNG trade. Not much physical trade, but certainly the arbitrage opportunities exist. Of course, until we get to, until we get to the last three or four months and suddenly the NBP's taken a, an uptick. And the reason there is we are seeing um, more spot trade in the continental market, which of course m will bring the British and the continental markets closer together. Um, British still, sh still struggling to come to grips with how it's gonna work. The way it's working is, is this mechanism. This has very, very important consequences, certainly for OECD, 
we are seeing spot trading grow and grow quickly. This is actually the transactions. The underlying volume is obviously smaller than this, but still very important. Driven, driven by two things, obviously, the wide disparity between contract prices, which have been 8 to $10, spot prices more like 4 or 5 Anyone who can wants to get to their hands on cheap gas. And, you know, sorry about the long-term contract, but my business is going broke, more or less. So what that means is, and we, we believe that underlying um, volumes in 2009 are somewhere between 80 and 100 BCM, approaching a quarter of European, pri European volumes. So that's a very interesting development with a very important security and, and market implications as well, um, and some benefits as well. Um, needless to say, our, our colleagues in Moscow, again, don't quite believe this, um, or at least they refuse to believe it, but it's another story. Um, power markets, interesting story. We spent a lot of time in, in the current review talking about electricity markets and the reasons for that are hopefully reasonably clear. Um, gas is a very important new market, a, a new, it's found a new market in the power sector and conversely, gas is making a very important contribution um, everywhere in OECD countries. Um, last decade, about 80% of new incremental electricity demand has been met by gas. A very astonishing convergence, lots of good reasons for that. A very strong business case, um, low capital cost, um, low greenhouse <coughs> footprint. All of those things are very accurate, very relevant, and the recession has made them even more relevant. We're seeing very small scale expansions of new nuclear, new coal, in fact only, only really significant new coal building in two OECD countries in, in the United States and Germany. So gas is still going to be there. Um, the interesting thing, how, but how do gas and coal play out, um, certainly in the recession in the next decade? The interesting thing is that the, the interface between gas and coal is going to become the most interesting part of the power sector in the next, in the next decade, that, that much is clear. And it's going to be much more interesting than we thought maybe a year ago. The US is the best example of that. Power demand down 4% last year. Still struggling to get back, certainly in, in the industrial sector, although I, not sus I suspect the residential sector or commercial might be pretty good today. Um, as you can see, they're a nice little peak, um, and that's gas-fired power. So gas-fired power actually grew last year in the United States, and that's, I guess that's a, a reflection of the ferocious competitiveness uh, of, of the gas supplies, but also the fact that coal in a number of regions rose last year. Coal prices have risen quite, quite sharply over the last 12 months, driven by China. So suddenly, um, suddenly what happens in OECD power markets, the balance between gas and coal is affected by Chinese coal imports. It gets complicated. Um, so that's the story for the US, completely different story in Spain where we have very large concentrations of new renewable power. Um, Spain about a 45 gigawatt peak um, demand economy, um, at least before the recession, more like, more like 40 these days, um, got about 20 gigawatts of wind. So when the wind blows, um, you don't need to burn anything else. And in fact, you get zero price events, which is interesting if you're a utility. Um, in Germany, we actually see negative price events. What that means is, of course, gas, as certainly oil price gas, the most expensive source gets backed out of the mix. And we can see something like 20% decline in gas-fired power in Spain. So if you're a Spanish utility and you're trying to manage gas um, shipments and take or pay contracts, this is a real problem. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about non-OECD um, demand because it is quite important and is in common with oil. This is a very big growth sector. People said, well, China, you know, China's a, a, a coal-based coal economy. Absolutely correct. Uh, a very big coal-based economy. Um, this year we're looking at 4,000 terawatt hours of power in China, which will make it the world's biggest power producer. If it certainly doesn't happen this year, it'll happen next year. Um, gas, very much a niche fuel. But you know, a <laughs> niche in China is a very big niche. Um, this, is a, this was a 70 BCM economy um, when we did the forecasts last year for WIO, and we had it going to 140. And you know, we had a pretty vigorous internal discussion about 140. You know, as people said, you know, doubling, gee, that's pretty aggressive. Um, 140 is looking very conservative now. Already last year through the recession, um, we, we believe China's a 90 BCM economy. This year, we'll definitely do more than 100, building, um, building and building and building. Turkmenistan China pipeline opened just before Christmas, it's taken three years to build, um, roughly the same size as the Rockies, Rockies Express pipeline, if you're familiar with that in the US, same length, roughly the same size, but they built it completely greenfields environment out in Turkmenistan, 30 BCM, um, first 10 or so BCM flowing as we speak, it'll, it'll be 20, it'll be 30 by 2012 or thereabouts, 
Myanmar pipeline also under construction and Chinese companies, um, as I said before, signing up LNG contracts like there's no tomorrow. This is a country that only started importing LNG in 2006, very small scale from Australia. We gave them an extremely good deal, which I prefer not to rake over. Uh, $3, $3 a million BTU seemed like a good idea at the time, but you know, that's another story. Um, China National Petroleum Corporation by 2015 easily importing 80 BCM, 80, which will make it the biggest um, gas importing company, I think, in the world um, from practically nothing a few years ago. We used to say that China was a policy constrained environment, that is to say, price controls and, and rigid internal um, government's procedures were, were constraining its use of gas, and that's absolutely correct. But um, it is very clear that over time that will change. A major policy decision to raise the wholesale price of gas by 25% starts to look a little bit like Henry Hub now, starts to become quite attractive. Um, we easily anticipate by 2015 um, there'll be 150, 160, 170 BCM of gas in that market, which would make it bigger. It's already bigger than any IEA gas user except um, the United States, and it'll make it one of the biggest in the world. We could talk about, um, don't forget India. Um, India grew 23% last year, again, and a, um, a country that was policy constrained, and of course policy constraints meant supply constraints. If you start to get rid of those, we had a very big, uh, a big fine. Krishna Godavari has come online now. That's led to a big increase. And of course, it's also put pressure on these internal pricing mechanisms to reform them. And we are seeing some change. It won't happen, it won't happen overnight. I said changing fast. That's perhaps a bit, a bit of an exaggeration. But it is clear that, that, ch that India in particular um, will, Im will produce more gas and will import more gas. But China and India between them, um, we anticipate 65 BCM of imports by 2012, which is only the year after next, that will be more than um, Europe imports by LNG um, as we speak. So these are very important emerging markets, a very important sign of growth policy um, making a big difference to them. Uh, I might add, of course, they will still remain coal-based economies. These are only niches, um, but pretty significant niches. So just to sum up, um, uncertainty in gas demand Obviously, the economic recovery, Europe in particular, looking very slow compared to North America and the Pacific. Pricing systems all over the place, um, very showing strong divergences, and that looks to continue, particularly the oil index pricing system under very significant pressure. Unconventional gas is changing um, the global gas game, not just from North America, but also potentially in China. Um, as I said, if we get a, a coal bed methane project up in Australia, um, and it's more likely to be one, two, or even three projects, then uh, inevitably that will have a big difference. LNG still to hit markets um, next year and the year after, putting even more pressure on those oil index prices. China in the Middle East, major growth markets. Haven't even talked about the Middle East. Again, some policy issues there. Low prices mean overconsumption and underproduction. Um, we saw, for example, Kuwait actually importing LNG from, of all places, Sakhalin. Um, when you see something like that happening, you know markets probably aren't working exactly the way they ought to be. Um, we can talk about that a bit more. So um, with those, w I'm happy to take questions from there on. Thank you, uh, Dick, uh, David, and Ian for a very clear exposition of the uh, medium-term outlook. I won't uh, take any time other than to just follow up on one point. Dick made a plea to improve data, and, uh, and I think, you know, it's obviously very close to my background, and, uh, and the IEA is clearly the, uh, in the lead in best practices in collecting energy data, and uh, I know the IEF ministers uh, agreed in um, April of this year to include natural gas in the uh, in their data collection, Dick, is, is you see that actually t having some real teeth, you know, going forward? Uh, have you has the IEA been asked already to, to participate in them? Either you or, or Ian, maybe uh, any, uh, talk to to that point. Are we going to see kind of a Jody for natural gas uh, anytime soon? Well, that's a, a, a very good question, Guy. I think that uh, Ian can correct, correct me if he has better information, but uh, I mean, um, we can only produce data for Jody if we receive the data, and we still have gaps in data from our own countries. 
And I think you, it's a safe bet that if our own countries are having trouble producing the, the data, uh, that uh, non-OECD countries will be even even less. Uh, so I, I don't think that we're going to have this data uh, immediately, um, but uh, we are certainly working as best we can with the resources we have to uh, to do it. But Ian, you might have some more comments on how the data has improved uh, of late. Yeah, I mean, if I when we started this effort five years ago to produce this this medium-term gas market review, our, our data was. To, to be blunt, pretty disappointing from our own member countries, let alone non-members. So we, we had to work around it, and we spent the last five years gradually working with, with our member countries to overcome, you know, all kinds of boring statistical issues. And as the fact to say, boring, they, you know, the bread and butter of statisticians to get comparable calorific values to, to, to measure these things in comparable ways. And, and after five years, I think we've got a reasonable, a reasonable outcome. Still, some to do. So you know, the time is is ripe to. To, to make this move to, to work more closely with the, the IEF um, and, and other, uh, other international organisations to try and do the same um, for places like the Middle East, um, for China, for India. We've, we've certainly been working with, with a lot of non-member countries to improve their data quality in oil and gas and coal and electricity. Um, so there's plenty of work to do. It, it, it will take time, there's no doubt about it. It won't happen overnight, but certainly um, we're willing and the IEF's willing. Let me open up for... Uh questions, and please uh, let us know your name and affiliation. Uh, I think you were the first, <laughs> sir. Uh, there'll be a microphone coming. possible reduction so you get away with the subsidy. Uh, are you talking about just countries in the Middle East or the type of uh, uh, benefits that oil companies even in this country, particularly like in the deep water, get with uh, free royalty or some other benefits that they get? Would that be considered subsidy as well? And since prices, as you mentioned, are going to go up, how realistic is the expectation to, for, for uh, you know, different countries to actually do away with subsidies? The second question is uh, on, uh, you correctly pointed out that uh, we're getting more liquids from gas. Um, and, uh, but on the slide that you showed for OPEC, uh, you actually just lo uh, uh, looked at the crude and uh, um, that was kind of interesting because uh, what there are uh, constraints with is the total liquid production, including the condensate. Uh, was this just a, uh, an honest mistake or there was some uh, attempt to show certain countries inability to uh, match others? I'm talking specifically about Iran that you, sh you showed. The reality is that last year, Saudi Arabia's uh, decline in production was uh, like three times more than uh, that of Iran. And since Iran's focus recently has been on the natural gas and there's been a considerable amount of uh, condensate production, uh, you know, that, that slide, uh, you know, I really didn't see any relevancy and, you know, of, of that, uh, you know, just, looking at the crude, not the total oil production. Thank you. David? Um, uh, taking your, your second point first, actually the, you, you should all receive a slide pack uh, on, I think, the yeah. CSIS. It'll be uh, on the website tomorrow. Website, and there's actually a much more complete set of slides than I ran through today. And there are slides in there that focus on uh, liquids growth as well as crude growth coming out of OPEC. And you're absolutely right. I mean, one of, one, of the, one of the four key incremental sources of NGLs is Iran. The others are Qatar uh, and Saudi Arabia. And I, I think the Emirates are the key sources of liquids growth coming out of OPEC. I missed that slide out because of time. And already I ran over time uh, ridiculously. But it, 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 it's a fair point. I think Iran, however, does face issues in terms of developing gas uh, quickly enough with the current investment regime that is in place, let alone uh, 
the difficulties that the country faces attracting investment for other reasons uh, in terms of the upstream overall. And they also have issues about the domestic use of gas and the requirement for extra gas, uh, <laughs> which ultimately is not going to be earning the country revenues, but they need to use for reinjection in mature oil fields. So we're not trying to ignore uh, an important source of liquids growth in Iran. You'll see it in your slide pack. Uh, it was left out for the sake of brevity uh, in this snapshot uh, picture. Um, the number I quoted in terms of subsidies, uh, if I'm correct, I think is, is end user price uh, subsidies. It's a global number, uh, but it's related to end user price subsidies. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be including uh, volumes of oil because of tax breaks or, or, or whatever. Yes, sir. Yes, I was in the middle there. Yes, sir. Coming, uh, Mike is coming. What's your uh, name? And, uh, Michael Toya? Wyman from EDF. Uh, I wanted to see if you had a, I don't know if you track, track this, but if you had a, a general range for marginal cost of production for crude oil worldwide, um, and if you could just give uh, some kind of range, um, that would be helpful. I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's a moving target, I think, is, is, is part of the answer. I mean, we've seen that costs, uh, to some extent, have come down uh, since their highs of, of 2007, early 2008. Um, we've done some work in terms of uh, our energy technology policy group uh, looking at production costs and resource size uh, with and without uh, carbon capture and storage and so on. Uh, so there's obviously a spectrum there. Um, we are generally speaking moving towards higher cost sources of oil. Uh, we've t heard a lot about the costs for oil sands development uh, lying somewhere within a sort of 60 to $80 per barrel range. Uh, ultra deep water Arctic supplies probably uh, not far out of that range either. Um, so we've done uh, quite a bit of work, not so much for uh, the short and medium term forecasting exercise, uh, but it's obviously something that our energy technology policy uh, people are, are looking at in quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, detail. Uh, obviously, talking about non-conventional supplies, we alluded to the biofuels part of the equation. And as I mentioned, we don't see second-generation biofuels, uh, something that could allow those fuels, one way or the other, uh, to generate more in terms of uh, incremental supply. We don't see those being particularly economic at prices below about $110 or $120 per barrel. Uh, but clearly, uh, there's a spectrum out there. Uh, there's an awful lot of cheap oil out there, let's not forget, that can be produced uh, by some of the key resource holders, which certainly doesn't cost uh, $80 per barrel uh, to bring to market. So that's something we need to remember. There is, a, there is another marginal barrel of supply that is, in a sense, constrained from reaching the market for reasons other than uh, pure economics. Thank you, and it's another example of uh, a lack of data. That you know, the, the question you ask, we really don't have very good cost data on a lot of, uh, as, as uh, David pointed out. So, uh, Al Hegberg, that question. Okay, as usual, Al's asked a very interesting and, and complicated question. 
Uh, I mean, from a, from a straight policy viewpoint, what needs to be done is, um, is already happening, for example, in Europe where governments are working very actively to break down the, the, the barriers to transactions that exist. I mean, in a case like, in a case, uh, just to pick Germany, for example, it was only a few years ago that Germany had 17 balancing zones in, in one country. And, you know, I think anyone who's been involved in the gas industry will know that I in that circumstance it's very hard to crack into that market, um, you know, in any, f in any significant way. Um, that's been reduced now to three and within, within a few years will be down to, effectively down to one. Um, we've seen the cost of um, balancing different calorific content in Europe. There's a high gas and a low gas. Um, we've seen those costs being internalised by the, by the system operator. So breaking those, those transaction costs down has certainly been um, a very major part of producing the increased gas on gas competition that we've seen in Europe. Um, you obviously you need to some extent the hardware, you need to be able to move this gas around as well. And of course one of the things we learnt in 2009 in the Ukrainian crisis was that <laughs> Europe's not very good at that. Um, but certainly it is getting better. Um, people are getting very creative under the, under the impetus of this gas on gas competition. Um, in swapping gas around and avoiding some of the hardware constraints, but Europe does need to spend more money on pipeline connections and, and I might add, storage, which is a very important part of this market. Europe is certainly not investing enough in storage. Um, certainly the, the fact that countries like China and India are starting to make some key policy decisions to free up their markets as well will produce much more gas on gas competition. Um, the oil, the, the guys who are selling oil indexes, of course, say, well, you know, this is just a transient phenomenon. It'll last a couple of years and then it'll all become a distant memory. Spot prices and oil indexes will converge. Maybe they're right. Um, I'd like to let the market decide that myself. Certainly it is bending at the moment, somewhere between 15 and 20 per cent of oil index volumes going into places like Turkey or Italy or Germany uh, are definitely on a spot prices and you can see that in the German, in the German context. Um, just, just to, well, I've got the floor, just a couple of contents on that subsidy issue the gentleman in the front row raised. That subsidy calculation covers gas and coal as well. Um, and you know, those subsidies are non-trivial as well and they, they're all over the planet. A lot of people have price controlled electricity, which does lead to overconsumption. I mean, one of the countries we got roundly criticised, I might add, for, in Fatty's analysis was South Africa. He said, well, you know, we don't have any subsidies, do we? Um, except for the fact that their utility um, can't cover its costs. So by any means we consider that a subsidy and indeed the utilities broke and, and they have blackouts. So we attempted to, to impute a cost to South African electricity and looked at the difference and, and we assigned that as a subsidy. So methodologically, yeah, you know, we have to be pretty, a um, little bit of bricolage, we call this in French, um, you have to be pretty innovative in your methodology, but it does include all fossil sources, not just oil. And I'm glad you didn't ask me about the marginal cost of gas production because <laughs> that's, that's, that's even tougher than oil. I hope that answers Al's question, it was, it was a good one. Jenny? Yes. Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, you, you said it causes... Um, okay, so, um, uh, so investing in biofuel ah, okay. is one of the factors to uh, increase the hunger for creation. And, uh, hunger. So I just want to know what uh, Food or fuel. Yeah. the yeah. system is. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you, you hit upon a key constraint on expanding uh, biofuel or the desirability of I I expanding the uptake of biofuels going forward based on first generation uh, crops. That's why the development of second generation technologies is so important. Uh, but clearly uh, we have markets in the US and Brazil in which these uh, technologies in a sense get some form of support. The second generation on its own with current levels of crude prices doesn't really fly, but it does solve precisely that 
sort of issue that uh, that biofuels confront uh, overall. But it, the, there is a there is an economic cost to that, and un, un in a sense unsubsidized, it doesn't work. Uh, the second generation. Bob McNally, wrap it in. Yeah, in interestingly enough, again, when I go to Moscow, I, I occasionally cop a lecture from the Gazprom people about how, how terrible the environmental impact of this shale gas is, interestingly enough. Um, obviously, we've been following developments with some, some interest. Um, you know, there, isn't, there isn't as yet a, a huge body of evidence that problems are being caused. I mean, lots of people are talking about it. Um, the, you know, I mean, the fracking liquids are an important part of the intellectual capital of of the companies doing this, and they're, you know, they are rather reluctant to to um, to reveal precisely what's in 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 the fluids, and that you know is is going to cause some, you know, has the potential to cause some difficulties. But at the moment, we we don't you know we don't see anything happening. Uh, I think you know obviously the events in the Gulf of Mexico underline that um, companies involved in energy extraction in general have a very significant responsibility. Obviously, if a problem did arise, then the, the implications again could be serious, but we haven't seen any evidence of, any real evidence of that happening. Certainly when you take um, shale, the, the whole, you know, the whole set of techniques that have made shale happen and, and try to put them to work in Europe, you, you do run into some immediate problems. I mean, one of those is simply ownership of subsoil resources, which in the United States is vested with the landowner, um, and in Europe was almost certainly vested with somebody else. Um, so obviously the locals don't have anywhere near the interest in having great bloody trucks drilling 24 hours a day and fracking liquids and so on. Uh, and Europe's a crowded place compared to most parts of the US. Um, so you know there are some significant non-technical, well there's some significant technical issues. There isn't the culture of hydrocarbon um, production you know, that there is in the United States. Um, so it's going to be hard to transfer those techniques and, and slow I suspect as well, even to places like Hungary where there is a a culture of hydrocarbon extraction. When they came to do this with uh, with Mole, with, with ExxonMobil, they air freighted a rig in from Houston. You know, um, just indicates they didn't have the technology, the, the gear there. Um, so even with the best will in the world, it's going to take some time to get to Europe. Um, certainly the Chinese, who have a fair bit, a, a bit more ability to make things happen in a hurry, um, are pretty interested, and they're pretty interested in coal and methane as well. One of the reasons they're been very keen to buy into Australian developments is to export that tech or take the technology with them back to China. They've got a bit of coal and they think um, they got they got very interested in coal and methane for safety reasons, um, which is the same way Australia got into it, but they're pretty interested in producing it as well. So unconventional gas writ large, uh, certainly very good prospects. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, my name is Kevin Easley. I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Policy and International Affairs, and I guess I want to ask about the other regulatory uncertainty that was referenced in the executive summary, and that being the future of commodity futures regulation. We know uh, before the July 4th recess here that the House passed the House Senate Conference Financial Regulatory Reform Bill. We know there's a CFTC proposal out to alter the status of commodity futures regulation. Just wonder what the panel thinks about these U.S. regulatory developments and their potential impact on oil and gas markets, uh, not only domestically but globally, particularly investment into new infrastructure and whatnot. I mean, I think we've uh, we've we've taken a fairly cons consistent line, which is that uh, the regulatory effort needs to recognize the the investment needs of the industry and the ability of physical players within the industry to be able to hedge uh, uh, for the future. Um, that being said, you know, the, the impetus behind uh, 
uh, greater regulate, regulatory oversight and greater visibility of what is going on in financial markets is very clear. And I think greater visibility on what is happening in, f in uh, commodity futures markets and derivatives markets is something that is, is helpful in terms of um, bringing a greater degree of stability to the market. Um, we have deliberately not taken a position as regards levels, you know, whether, whether a certain level of position limits or, or uh, capital requirements uh, is appropriate or not. That is something that the regulators themselves, both nationally and internationally, must decide upon. Uh, we've simply made the appeal uh, that regulators need to have m or be mindful of the requirements of a very capital-intensive industry to be able to hedge uh, investments. Okay. Um, any further? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. I just might point out, as an Australian, we're a supply country too. Um, so uh, I do have some insight into supp supply countries' uh, approaches on these things. Um, just a point to make, of course, is that gas in general, um, you know, notwithstanding the, the current, current gas glut and the, and the ferocious efficiency gains we've seen in the United States, gas in general, like oil, is going to have to come from further away, from more remote places, from deeper water, from places like Stockman, where ice sort of floats along. Um, Northwest Shelf, the Gorgon, the very remote areas where costs are high. So, um, if that gas is going to be developed, then there have to, has to be market equilibrium that supports that high cost and long lead time development. I mean, Gorgon's, Gorgon, well, you know, it's a minimum five years, and a lot of preliminary work is done. So there is there is a tremendous tension there between between costs and and, and end users. Um, you know, you have to look at the power sector as well and look at what are the alternatives, particularly relative. Well relatively cheap coal where, where prices are rising in a lot of markets and the carbon cost is being attached. So, so it's a very complex question you've asked. Um, certainly when we see conditions like this um, with oversupply, you know, our strong preference is to see competitive markets sorted out in a, in a realistic way and, and not lead to this amazing price dichotomy. Um, from a Gazprom viewpoint, they prefer um, oil index prices and they want to stick with that. They see that as part of their anatomy. Um, the Algerians to a, a lesser degree. Um, how will it pan out? I mean, obviously, over time we will see um, the gas, the gas oversupply worked out, um, but not in a way we anticipate. I think we will certainly see higher prices in the Pacific Basin compared to the Atlantic Basin, for, and, and continuing geographical differences between those markets. And and you'll see some markets have their own index formulas. I mean, the power sector, I can see quite happily having its own set of formulas based on its own particular needs. Other sectors will have different um, different pricing formulas. So, I mean, and that's what happens in a, in a proper liberalised market. You've only got to look at the United Kingdom. There are still oil index m contracts being bought and sold, not very many, um, but certainly in the power sector you see contracts on the dark spread, um, you know, look, betting on the difference between um, coal prices and, and gas prices. So, you know, we'd like to see a much more, uh, a much more differentiated approach, a much more fundamental approach that reflects market realities, but at the same time, you, you have to understand that um, gas won't be cheap forever. Um, gas will increasingly come from more expensive sources. I mean, everyone's been astonished how US gas producers have been able to continue producing and expanding uh, at, at $4 prices, um, but you know, I don't think that party can go on forever. 
to be blunt. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have uh, time for this afternoon. So please join me in uh, once again thanking Dick, David, and Ian for outstanding. And thank.